Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, looking from the east. With Steve Zercher in Kobe, Japan. Kansai Gadai University is where he teaches. He teaches business and entrepreneurship when he's not teaching in the Scheidler College of Business right here in Honolulu. Welcome to the show, Steve. It's always nice to talk to you. Thank you very much, Jay. It's a pleasure. And uh, I'm sure you want to know if I'm wearing a mask now or not. And uh, the answer to that is, uh, no, I'm not. And the answer to the question, the next question is, why not? <laughs> well, it's just me in my house right now. And Jay, uh, you know, I don't know where you've been lately, but I think uh, between the phone here, I'm pretty, I'm safe. At least I'm hoping. I think you ought to be concerned if one day we have one of these shows, you know, and you can see me and I am wearing a mask. That would be of great concern, <laughs> but so far we're not we're yeah. not there yet, and we, and we have no uh, yeah. that I know of. Do we have reported guests uh, reported uh, this, you know cases of the virus here in Honolulu? I don't think we do. I don't think we do. Um, in any event, there's been no okay. deaths here. So the question we're going to talk about today is coronavirus. I mean that's on everybody's mind. In fact, the U.S. stock market yep. went down a thousand points today. That's huge. That's like uh, 2008 already. It's 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 profound, and uh, word has it that right. this is all because of fear over the the economy, the global economy that will result from this as it expands. And in fact, uh, Italy took took a hit today. Hundreds of cases reported, and um, you know what you clearly have is a is a global may I say pandemic. Uh, if you look at the map of the world and see where all the cases are, the cases are everywhere. Um, so we need to address, you know, what's happening and, and actually more to the point, what will happen. So big question, what's happening in Japan? Japan had a whole affair with that Princess Cruise Liner, and uh, I, I'm sure that you have some yeah. thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I do. And uh, actually, it turns out my sister works for Norwegian Shipping Lines, which owns the Diamond Princess, and I saw her a couple of weeks ago in uh, Los Angeles, chatting with her briefly about this. Of course, this is a crisis uh, for them. But just to catch up everybody who's listening on the number of cases worldwide, I just checked before our show started, Jay, and there's almost 80,000 cases reported worldwide, 2,629 deaths. So the mortality rate is 3.2%. Um, of course, China is number one, and Korea has just leaped, leapt up to uh, second place in terms of number of infections. So that country probably has crossed over into a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly how the government is responding to that. Uh, and then the, number three is, has a separate category. It's within Japan, but it's what you mentioned, the Diamond Princess line. Uh, and the number of cases there is, is quite high. Uh, almost 700 cases now in the Diamond Princess. Wow. In Japan, yeah, yeah, it's, it's about 20% of the people on the, who are on the ship, although there's still 1,000 on the ship, those are employees that are still under quarantine, and I'm sure they're being tested quite a bit. But, yeah, 20% of all people on the boat have become infected, and three have died out of the 690 that have been diagnosed with the uh, coronavirus so far. But let me let me uh, just return to what's going on in Japan in general, Jay. Before so, you do that, Steve. Overall, before you do that, there was a yes, there was a, a bit of a, um, an issue about returning the passengers from the Princess uh, Line uh, to the United States. Oh, yeah. Uh, and apparently the yeah, that, uh, want... yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I do want to talk about that because this has become a controversy now within Japan. But but let me just briefly cover what's going on in Japan Okay. outside of the Diamond Princess, and then we can return to the Diamond Princess. So the general conditions here in Japan, of course, people are concerned. Uh, this is the number one news story on a daily basis. Outside of the Diamond Princess, however, the number of infections is still relatively low considering but we're a country of 120 million people. There's 160 cases outside of the ship. <clears throat> but people are 
responding to the perceived threat or to the threat itself. Uh, the, peop- the number of people wearing masks is quite high. I was flying just recently. Uh, I left Japan. 100% of the Japanese people who got on the plane were wearing masks. Of course, mm-hmm. being within a plane is a perfect environment for the transmission of these types of viruses. So yes. very, very concerned. And um, there's daily reports by the government on uh, what's what's happening, the new the new cases that are surfacing, and what the government is attempting to do uh, in order to try and make sure that we don't have a repeat of what's going on in China. Certainly, that's the worst case scenario, or what's going on in Korea with the the high number of cases being reported in the last week or so. Mm. So that's the that's the general conditions. I people are still on the trains not wearing masks. Um, I think I would say that there is a general high level of concern, but there's not a fear. We haven't crossed over to the point where people are really concerned. When you, you know, there's still Chinese tourists here in Japan. Uh, my wife went to a ski resort over the weekend, and there were Chinese people there. So they're being led into the country. If they're from Wuhan, uh, they're not being led into the country. But if they're not from that region, they're being led into the country. So there's. Again, there's high concern, but we haven't crossed over to the point where there's a real sense of urgency about this. Or, for example, the Japanese government is not close, so far as I can tell, banning all Chinese tourists from coming into the country. Or, frankly, that may extend, if it is if it is done, it would extend to Koreans now as well, since the Korean uh, incidence rate is going up so highly. So that's where we are. So what right is now. what, in fact, is the Japanese government doing? You know, Jay, I don't know, we, we talked a month or so ago about this, and you asked me that question, and I said the Japanese government seemed to be doing a fairly good job in reasonably uh, informing the public about the risk rate and putting uh, up additional screening, for example, for tourists coming into the country. So I was reluctantly admitting that the government was doing a good job. However, now with the Diamond Princess incident and how that was handled, the Japanese government is perceived as really failing uh, to protect the Japanese population. So then it's primarily focused on how they handle the Diamond Princess. How did they handle so the Diamond Princess? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, let me go, go into that. So currently, there's 690 people who have been infected with the virus. That, again, is 20% of the total number of people on the boat. And that number is increasing um, every day. There are three people who have died that were on the boat from the infection. The criticism that's being focused on the government right now is how they handled this. So what they did is they forced the Diamond Princess to basically go into a quarantine. So they wouldn't let anybody in. Or, well, they wouldn't let anybody off, or if you were going in, you had to wear protection for 14 days. And I, the thought was at the time that, well, we can't let these people off the boat until they go through the two-week quarantine period. But what happened in reality is that more and more people got infected on the boat. It was like a Petri dish. Mm. Basically, they created the environment where the infection rates just took off. The ship was not able to protect their customers from the infected customers from the customers who were not infected. Then, so that's one thing. Then at the end of the 14 days, they allowed a thousand people to go off the boat that had tested negative to go straight into the public. Mm-hmm. So they went right off the bus, uh, right off the boat, and got into taxis and trains and buses. And went home. And what's happening now is those people are becoming uh, symptomatic now. They're they're actually infected. So they were released into the public, being negative at the time coming off the boat. But then the incubation period, they they haven't figured this out or how the transmission has occurred with this disease. Um, And they're now in the general public. So the Japanese public is going, why did you do that? Now, in the case of the United States or other countries, that took their citizens off the boat and then flew them back home, they immediately went back into quarantine again. So, for example, the American citizens that were taken off the boat, Mm -hmm. they were flown to some Air Force base. I think it was in California. 
and they were put under watch for another 14 days. But in the case of the Japanese government, they just let these people go. So that's being deemed as irresponsible and not recognizing the significance of the threat. So to answer your question, right now there is a lot of criticism of the government for, number one, forcing the boat to go through a quarantine, which actually made the infection rates go up. I mean, I guess they had good intentions, but the outcome was not positive. And then how they handled the release of the customers, the Japanese ones, coming off the boat, letting them go directly into the public. So that what, is also being... Uh, so what, what have we learned? <clears throat> Boiling all that down, what have we learned about it? I guess we've learned that the incubation period could be longer than 14 days. Or maybe it's the secondary, yeah, I don't know the how... secondary incubation period, right? In other words, somebody is infected and yeah. he gets through the 14 days fine, but in the course of the 14 days, he's in fact infected a number of others whose 14 days begins running sometime in the middle of the initial 14 days, right? Something like that. That seems very reasonable and very logical to, to have that thought. I, I don't know why they figure that the clock started for everybody on day one. Mm -hmm. You're exactly right, Jay. The infection could occur on the 10th day or the 12th day while these people were cooped up on the boat. Yeah. And they're released, and they're not showing any signs of the virus, and then they get out and go home, and they do. So that's happening in Japan right now. Yes. So as a result, the the, um, the ratings, the, the support for the government uh, is beginning to go down a bit. This, this is not the only factor. Uh, the economy last quarter shrunk by 6%. <clears throat> That's the Q4 of 2019, and without a doubt, because of the coronavirus, the economy is going to shrink here again in Japan. So technically, Japan will go into a recession, uh, one, on economic, because of economic reasons. There's a recent tax increase in Japan that forced the, forced the economy into, uh, into a, uh, a shrinking environment, and then the coronavirus. So you mentioned the stock market impact of this. Um, the economic impact of this virus on Japan, the fastest growing industry, I guess up until this quarter, in Japan has been inbound tourism. Uh, it's, it's booming uh, year over year. And now it's beginning to trail off. And I suspect the numbers are actually going to turn negative uh, in terms of inbound tourism for Q1. Mm -hmm. Just a, as a side note, Kyoto, which is has experienced over tourism for the last five years, is now running a campaign called Empty Kyoto. Come to Kyoto now because it's empty. Come to Kyoto because in the hills in Kyoto, there's more monkeys than there are people. It's the first time that that's happened in 10 years. So already Japan tourism industry is feeling the pressure of the lack of foreign tourists coming in because of the coronavirus. So. Also, I noted, uh, you and I were talking before the show, I, I get email on travel deals. Mm -hmm. The cruise lines are offering five-day tours for $100. So clearly, the general public has looked at what's happened to the Diamond Princess and the fact that cruise ships are an environment where this type of uh, this virus can easily transfer from one person to another. So the PR on um, the Diamond Princess, and on, uh, reflecting on the cruise lines overall is very negative. So as a result, they're slashing their prices and trying to get people to get on these boats. So I don't know, Jay, what your risk tolerance is, but you can take a five-day cruise in the Caribbean for $124 now if you want. Well, you know, my, my wife and I were going to go to Vietnam uh, in the middle of March. We canceled that trip, um, not only because of the risk of, of, of contagion uh, on the ship or in Vietnam, but because of the risk of contagion and we would call it travel difficulties getting to Vietnam and getting back from Vietnam, um, very threatening to somebody, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on in years and it's very threatening to me and my wife to be in that kind of environment. So we're not gonna, we're gonna, not gonna take trips like that and going forward. <clears throat> and so, uh, sure, I can understand they wanna charge a hundred dollars for a four or five day trip. Uh, two factors come to mind, one is, uh, when you get on that ship, they'll find other ways to raise raise the the gross off your presence there. Um, you know that's only that's only the admission 
uh, or the cover charge. But but as you as you spend the time on the ship for the four or five days, they'll make other money. But th th that doesn't change the basic circumstance. The basic circumstance is that you can't have a ship, you know, with how many passengers were on the were on the Princess uh, cruise, uh, thousands and thousands of them. <laughs> How many? Yeah, three thousand nine hundred. That's huge. Three thousand nine hundred. Huge. And so if, they, yeah, if that it's, if that ship massive. stops operating, okay, crew or no crew, they still have to maintain it. Uh, crew or no crew, they still have have daily fixed expenses that are enormous. And yep. imagine that ship just stays right. stays at the dock. Just the, the the costs of staying at the dock are enormous. So they're really uh, jeopardized, and they're really uh, you know concerned about the viability of their cruise companies. They make a lot of money in the good times, but this is the bad times. And some of them, I think, are going to go out of business. Uh, nobody's going to take any trips on cruise ships for a while. And this leads me to my next question to you, Steve. You know, <clears throat> so that's just yeah. travel. That's just travel. In China, people haven't been going to work, although the government now wants to, you know, uh, start them working again, re restart the economy, so to speak. I'm not sure how successful or smart that idea is, but what about Japan? What about other countries where people don't want to go to work? It's not a matter of wearing a mask. Yeah. It's a matter of staying home. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question here in Japan. There uh, are a number of conferences. Actually, I was scheduled for two entrepreneurial conferences this week, and both of them have been canceled. In, uh, in respect or in regards to the possible risk of spreading of the coronavirus. The city of Osaka has suspended all meetings, period, for the next month. Uh, so through March 20th, I believe, there will be no conferences, no large meetings at all that are sponsored or have anything to do with the city of Osaka. So that's occurring sporadically throughout the country, and then there's an economic impact there. Now, to your question about work, that came up last week. And um, what the government was recommending that businesses do is to allow their employees to telecommute, basically to call in and, or do Zoom or do like what we're doing right now. And uh, it, remarkably, the company said, no, hmm. that's not allowed. And this is a, this is a cultural issue in Japan. Um, in Japan, you're not doing work unless you're sitting at your desk. Even if you're doing absolutely nothing, and the white-collar productivity for Japan is one of the worst in the developed world, so many of them are absolutely, actually doing nothing at their desk. The cultural perception, the way businesses view their employees is that you have to physically be present in the office for you to be doing work. So despite the threat, uh, despite the uh, you know the 160 people who have been infected and uh, one or one or two people who have died in Japan and the fact that this could spread potentially to something much much worse, the Japanese companies are saying no, our employees cannot call in, our employees cannot work at home, they have to get on the train, you know, and you know how crowded the trains are in Japan, oh, and yeah. that of course is a high risk area for transmission. Yeah. But it's business as usual. I'm you know I'm not. Making a pun there, it's business as usual in terms of how Japanese companies are asking their people to come into the office where they can watch them work and then therefore be credited with actually working. Oh, well, I think they're going to have a problem with that. Now, if get, they don't have a quarantine going. Yeah, if it gets, and, and without a quarantine no, and, and no, asking people to continue to go to work, they're asking for a, uh, you yeah. know, a, a, a multiplication of the virus. Right. I teach a class about uh, marketing and culture. This is a very good example of how culture is dominating potential infection risk. Because Japanese businesses don't feel you, you can work unless you're in the office sitting at your desk where, they, where you can be observed. Um, they're overlooking the potential risk of this virus becoming much more serious in the country. Now, if Japan follows Korea, and all of a sudden, instead of 160 cases, we have 16,000 cases. Maybe the government will just issue an edict and say, you know, employees need to work from home. But right now, at the level of threat that's perceived by 
the businesses, they're insisting that their people come to work as per normal. Well, whether they work, um, you know, in the office and do very little, um, because their business partners aren't doing very much in this in this crisis, or whether they work at home and do do it from home, they're still doing less than they might have done had had the crisis not taken place. And you find that you know it's not just the cruise lines, it's not just the tourism industry, it's going to be the mom and pops, the stores down the block, the factories, um, you know, everything and everybody is going to be impacted by this, not only in Japan, but in, in any country where either the people or the government or both are concerned about public health. And when you add to that, uh, you know, the, the crisis in confidence on Wall Street today, thousand points down. And when you add to that, uh, you know, the fact that we have we have a world map, which was published in The New York Times, showing red for every country which has been affected. And gee, a, a huge number of countries have been affected, some some in substantial numbers, and including Europe, and most recently including Italy, which which has a, a you know a huge increase in the number of cases. You have a global, may I say, panic. You have a global pandemic at the least, and this has got to have an mm. effect. And I'm really asking here: this has got to have an effect on on the global economy. And I wonder if you can spend a little time uh, on your views about that. And what happens, you know, when the global economy is affected? Is it is it going to affect you and me? Is it going to affect our way of life, our quality of life? Is it what what is good, what happens when the global economy all comes down at the same time? Wow, Jay, that that's a that's a big question. I I, I agree with the basic premise behind it that this uh, virus, even at its current level will have a, a profound impact on worldwide economy. Travel is 10% of the worldwide GDP. Uh, I think that number is approximately correct. And this is just like you canceling your trip to Vietnam. I just got a note from my, uh, my son's teacher. She was going to America. She's canceling that now as well. Um, so the airline industry, uh, the, tra the, the hotel industry, all of the uh, Businesses affected by travel, the mom and pop stores like you're talking about that cater to foreign tourists, all of them are going to be profoundly impacted, and that will affect the GDP in individual countries and, and worldwide. You know, if this continues unabated and the numbers of infection uh, go beyond the 80,000, you know, going to the 200,000 or 300,000 or even, you know, heaven forbid, in, into the millions of people, yeah, we could have a worldwide depression. I mean, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to overplay this, but this could slow, certainly make the worldwide economy turn negative, and maybe the numbers could be significantly down if this has a freezing effect on worldwide trade. You know, for example, it's not just people; it could be products as well. It, it, from two respects, Jay. One, uh, the Japanese manufacturers of cars and so forth are now not getting supplies from China because various locations are being quarantined. So there's no workers to make the parts that the Japanese companies need. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Steve Zercher uh, in uh, Kobe, Japan. I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I have a TV show based on my book, which is also called Beyond the Lines. And it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and building winning teams. We are having a fun drive for Think Tech Hawaii. And please, 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 please help us keep these shows going. Please go on our website, thinktechhawaii.com, to donate. Thank you. You started. Oh, okay. okay. All right, Steve. Let's right, you... let's hear more about the global economy. Yeah, as I was saying, um, the, the immediate impact, of course, is the freeze that this is uh, 
that's occurring when it comes to international travel. Uh, already subsidies are being given to Korean airlines and Chinese airlines by the governments because their, their planes are flying nearly empty now. Uh, the impact there is very clear and apparent, and that's going to certainly negatively impact the worldwide, worldwide economy. But then also, I, this is my own speculation, this did not happen when SARS broke out in the early 2000s, but it could be unless scientists figure out how the transmission occurs, there could be some concern that the virus can be latent on a, on a product rather than being transmitted by a person. Now, I'm not a doctor or a scientist, but if that occurs, if people become fearful of actually using products that are coming from highly infected areas, like China, for example, that would have a secondary negative effect on the worldwide economy. Well, let me, let me, add, something, so, let me add something that is, uh, that is very personal to uh, ThinkTech. Um, so we, we order things through uh, Amazon all the time, all the time. They are our main supplier for studio gear. Um, and one such piece of gear, maybe more than one, uh, is, is fabricated in China. And in fact, it tells you that on the Amazon site. And in fact, for details on the order, you, you call a number in China and they talk to you, in, you know, from China uh, with a Mandarin accent, everything. Okay, so they have to fabricate this thing, and then they're going to send it to us, as they have in the past. And it's going to come in a cardboard box, and it'll be delivered, because right now I think there's no constraint on that. Uh, it'll be delivered through the Amazon system, and we will receive it here at the studio. And I am thinking, I've been thinking ever since I ordered this thing, uh, that gee whiz, what's, what's on the box? Uh, you know, is it possible that the virus travels on the box? Or take the box off. Yeah. What's what's uh, what's on the on the uh, the equipment that is within the box? Um, how do I protect myself? Do I spray the box? Do I let the box sit there for a month or two or three or four um, <laughs> before I open the box? So you know, this is just me, and I'm not really that worried about it. But but the fact is that when you're getting yeah. something from China, it's being made in China. You ask yourself that question. And I think a lot of people must yep. be asking themselves that question. Why should I order this from China right. when we don't know exactly how the virus is transmitted? Yep. So, yeah, it was my off the top of my head idea, but the Jay seems like you share that concern. And I'm sure there are millions of people right now that are asking them that question, themselves that question. Unless we can determine that this virus is only transferred human to human, you know, scientists can tell us that, then there is a concern about how this is actually being transferred. I don't know. I, I'm not, uh, I haven't, you know, the scientists, the doctors, the researchers, I'm sure they're spending a lot of energy on this, but I haven't seen anything, maybe Jay, you can correct me, as to how this is actually transferred, what the incubation rate is. Uh, and so forth. So there's still a lot of questions at this point. Well, my understanding, Maybe in a few weeks they'll figure it out. My, my understanding from the shows we've done on the subject is that, A, if somebody coughs or sneezes at you or near you, you're going to pick up the, uh, the droplets, and they're going to get into your you know, yeah. respiratory system. That one's easy. Um, but B, and this is more complicated, is if you go into a, an environment where people have their hands, they slough off the virus, right? And people have their hands on, yeah. on the seats in an airplane, on anything they touch, and then you later touch that, uh, then what you have is a, a situation where you're, you're touching your hands, then have the virus on them. Now, later on, you might decide to touch your face or your nose or your mouth or the food that you're eating or your eyes. So all these are entryways. Um, and so... It, yeah. could be, it could be a combination or an accumulation of these various, these various ways of the modus operandi where the virus can get at you. And I agree with you, we don't know, but you know, we, I think we have to be conservative in evaluating how this all works. The big question mm. for me is mm. how long does the virus last before it goes inert? Right. We, I don't know if we have an answer on that one. Doesn't seem to be. so. So to get back to your question, the, the clear negative impact on the worldwide economy, maybe even to the point where the worldwide GDP was negative in Q1 this year, 
is on the travel industry. And then secondarily, it, it's the potential risk of a product person or, you know, physical item to person infection, which we don't know the answer to right now. Hopefully, scientists will figure that out. But that could potentially have a secondary strong impact on the worldwide economy. So I'm hopeful. SARS, as I remember, I was in Asia back then, um, did have a major economic impact, but most of it had to do with the tourism industry. Mm -hmm. And there weren't secondary effects beyond that. But this, of course, is much, much bigger much, much uh, more broadly spread. Well, from an entrepreneurial I, point of view, to... Steve, from, from a, you know, um, a business and entrepreneurial point of view, evaluating what happens, let's assume yeah. that a lot of business can't, can't do businesses. Let's assume that the you know, gross uh, product is substantially reduced. Uh, let's assume that yeah. uh, when you want to go to work, whether you're working at home or in the office, there is no work because the company is just going out of business. They're not earning any revenue, and they can't continue, uh, like the cruise ship problem. I mm -hmm. think the cruise ships are in jeopardy. Right. Um, so what happens? Right. So how does it how does it trip down the scale? How does it affect? How does it get from there as, as a global phenomenon uh, to me at home in my house? How does it how does it get down the track that way? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I guess it depends on what business you're in. Um, if you're your business is dependent on international trade or tourism, you're at significant risk. Uh, there could be upside for some businesses that are more domestically oriented. Like, for example, in Japan, domestic travel may take off. Um, for my own, to answer from my own personal perspective, uh, I'm the dean of the Asian Studies Program at Kansai Gaidai University. We're very dependent on foreign exchange, foreign exchange students. So we have 317 this semester. But perhaps in the fall, that number will drop by half because parents are not going to want to send their students to Asia. So I, I, my business could be dramatically impacted. And if that happens, then we, have, we could have way too many teachers than, than we need. We'd have to reallocate them. The way it works in Japan is you can't fire people uh, as, as you can in the United States. And many of these professors have tenure. So we would have to reallocate them maybe to domestic students only. So it could have a profound effect on my business. Actually, Jay, that had not occurred to me until you asked the question, but that's something I'm going to have to begin to plan for. We could face a 50% drop off on the number of students that come to Japan because of the risk of the coronavirus here. Yeah, I, well, I think it's uh, something like the well, domino, we, the domino theory. You know, one thing begets another thing begets yeah. another thing, and then it goes logarithmic where everything right. is affected and and the effect is is bad. The only the only um, you know point of optimism I think, which is which is a real possibility, is that this will burn itself out. It'll burn itself out in a matter of time. Uh, and the and the question is yeah, how, I, how long. I was just looking at the second-by-second uh, second updates on the number of uh, cases, and it's, it's a linear scale. It actually, it's, it's beginning to show signs of platforming out. I'm looking at it right now, and February 15th, and the number was around, I'm just guessing here, about 75,000 or so, and February 21st, we're just under 80,000. So there, the curve, if you follow it projected forward, shows that maybe it'll plateau out. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, in SARS, yeah, in SARS, it did plateau out. I don't know that there was anything that science did. It just the virus ran its course, and then the infection rates began to drop. Yeah, we can only hope. We'll anyway, see. Steve, we have to follow this uh, going forward. Uh, we'll talk again in two weeks, yes. and maybe things will be different. I hope they'll be better or at least a sign of light at the end yes. of the tunnel. Uh, Steve Zercher, I look, Kansai yeah, Gadai University in, uh, in Kobe, Japan. We look forward to talking with you again, yes. Steve. Aloha. Always a pleasure, Jay. Thank you so much.